The pilots never saw this midair collision coming, and tragically, this photograph was taken by a passenger on one of the planes right before impact, and there was nothing that anyone could do at that point to prevent this tragedy. That's why in today's video, we're gonna take a look at how this happened and what you need to know to stay safe. My name is Hoover, and welcome to your Pilot Debrief. On May 13th, 2019, a DHC-2 Beaver and a DHC-3 Otter collided in midair near Ketchikan, Alaska. Now, this was a terrible tragedy as both aircraft were conducting VFR sightseeing tours under the provisions of Part 135 operations. The Beaver was carrying a pilot and four passengers, and the Otter had one pilot and ten passengers, and this was a beautiful sunny day with mostly clear skies, and they departed from the nearby Misty Fjords National Monument and were planning to fly by a scenic waterfall near Mahoney Lake before landing at the Ketchikan seaplane base. The two pilots worked for different companies and had independently planned separate routes of flight. The Beaver took off first around 12.02 p.m. and planned to fly a direct route, while the Otter departed about one minute later and planned to take a more scenic route to the north. You can see their ground speed and altitude in the bottom right, and they're separated by about a thousand feet in altitude for most of the flight. But as they approach the falls, the otter starts to descend while the beaver initiates a shallow climb. As they cross over the inlet and approach the falls, they collide at an altitude of about 3,300 feet. After the collision, the otter makes an immediate right-hand turn and crashed in the waters of the inlet. One passenger on the Otter sustained fatal injuries in the crash, while the pilot and nine others were able to escape the aircraft into the water and were taken to shore by a local boat that was nearby. Unfortunately, the Beaver broke up in flight and the pilot and all four passengers sustained fatal injuries. No one ever expects to be involved in a mid-air collision. I know there's a lot of people that believe in the big sky theory to stay safe, and that's this idea that two randomly flying airplanes are extremely unlikely to collide because of the vastness of the sky relative to how small aircraft are. But this is not a theory that I would rely on, especially in a situation like this, because one of the risks of sightseeing tours is that they tend to all converge on the same sites as the pilots are trying to position the aircraft for the best views for the passengers, while often narrating the tour in a congested area. And oftentimes, as in this situation, the area isn't covered by air traffic control. That means pilots have to rely on the technology on board the aircraft to maintain awareness of other traffic, but more importantly, they also have to visually look outside and apply a concept known as see and avoid. The reason it's so important to actively scan for other traffic is because according to this FAA advisory, the number one cause of mid-air collisions is the failure to adhere to the see and avoid concept, and that's why we're taking such a close look at this mishap. But first, I want to point out that these were routine flights that both of these pilots had probably done several times before. The Beaver pilot had a commercial certificate with multiple ratings and was also a certified flight instructor with about 11,000 hours of total flight time. The Otter pilot held an airline transport certificate with commercial privileges and was also a certified flight instructor with about 25,000 hours of flight time, and there was nothing in the investigation to even remotely suggest that either of these pilots weren't fit for flight. They both had plenty of experience, and if anything, this is a good reminder how things can still go wrong no matter how many hours of flight time you have. As both aircraft are making their way to the falls, in addition to visually clearing outside and adhering to the see and avoid concept, both aircraft had different avionics and tools that the pilots were using to maintain awareness of nearby traffic. And most of you might be familiar with ADS-B, which stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. But here's a quick refresh on how it works, because this is going to play a role in the crash. There's ADS-B out and ADS-B in. Now the out component works by transmitting your aircraft's GPS location, altitude, and ground speed once per second to ground stations and to any aircraft that has ADS-B in capability. The in component is what allows your aircraft to receive that data, process it, and then display the traffic information in the cockpit to enhance the awareness of the pilot. ADS-B is great because of the accuracy and reliability of it. In fact, after this mishap, the FAA mandated ADS-B out equipment on all aircraft operating in the airspace designations on this chart. But that wouldn't have made a difference in this situation for two reasons. 
First of all, the Ketchikan area where the mishap took place is Class E and Class G airspace, so ADS-B out is not required. But the second reason it didn't matter has to do with the equipment each of these aircraft is flying with, because their systems should normally provide them with sufficient warning when a collision is imminent, but you're about to find out why that never happened and also why these two pilots never saw each other. The pilot flying the DHC-3 Otter has two Chelton Electronic Flight Instrument System displays located in front of him that serve as a primary flight display or a multifunction display. The other piece of equipment on the right side is a Garmin control panel that I'll talk more about later. For now, each of the Chelton displays in front of the pilot can provide traffic information and this NTSB simulation shows what that might have looked like during the flight. The cyan arrowheads represent other aircraft, and the numbers next to them represent the difference in altitude and hundreds of feet. If an aircraft gets within 6 miles horizontally and 1200 feet vertically, like the Beaver does here, then the arrowhead is colored in. The only problem in the Otter is that because of the type of receiver they have on board, there is no capability to generate oral or visual traffic alert messages, so the pilot has to continuously scan for a colored in arrowhead in order to see the threat. This can obviously be very challenging for a pilot to do when you're trying to conduct a sightseeing tour and visually positioning the aircraft while also clearing for terrain and other traffic. You're spending a lot of your time looking outside and that's why the concept of seeing and void is so important instead of solely relying on the technology in the aircraft. During a post-accident interview, the Otter pilot stated that he last recalled looking for traffic about four minutes before the collision. He recalled seeing two groups of blue triangles, but he didn't really perceive them as going to be a threat to him, and he didn't look at the display again before the collision. Meanwhile, over in the Beaver, the pilot is using ForeFlight, and that's a little different because it's going to depict the Beaver in the center of the display, and the other aircraft are represented as colored in arrowheads regardless of how close they are. But anytime an aircraft gets within 1.8 miles horizontally and 1,200 feet vertically, the system will generate an oral and visual traffic alert, and that means that 1 minute and 44 seconds prior to impact, this is what that warning should have looked and sounded like. Traffic, 3 o'clock, 2 miles, 400 feet above. The only problem is that the Beaver never got this traffic alert, because although it was receiving data from the Otter, it was an incomplete picture. The Otter wasn't transmitting pressure altitude, and that means the ForeFlight display would look similar to this. Without altitude data, the ForeFlight application in the Beaver will never trigger an alert. And something else the NTSB pointed out was that if the Beaver pilot had selected the option to hide distant traffic, normally that would only hide aircraft that are more than 15 miles away or more than 3,500 feet above or below you. But it also hides any aircraft that aren't reporting altitude. So it's possible, depending on the display settings, that the Beaver pilot never even saw the Otter on his display. And if you're wondering why didn't they just look outside and see each other, I'm going to explain what happened in just a minute. But first, the reason the Otter isn't transmitting pressure altitude is because of this Garmin control panel that I mentioned earlier. The unit was turned off, and the pilot said he wasn't aware it was off, and he was not the one that turned it off. As far as he knew, if everything looked normal on his Chelton displays, then there was no need to even mess with the Garmin panel. This is a great example of how the holes in the Swiss cheese can line up and a mishap can take place. You've got the timing, the speed, and the routes of these two aircraft, putting them in the exact same place at the same time, and then we have a critical piece of equipment that's left turned off in the Otter, and we have limitations on warnings in both of these aircraft. And this is just a good reminder, I think, that technology is only as good as we understand the capabilities and limitations of it. But that brings us back to the see and avoid concept, and how was it possible for the passengers to see each other, but the pilots didn't? And something I didn't mention earlier was that a camera was rolling on the Otter, filming out the right-hand side away from the direction of the Beaver but a female voice is heard on the recording eight seconds before impact saying, pull up. And then again at the very last fraction of a second, pull up, pull up. The Otter pilot didn't hear these words. And meanwhile, over in the Beaver, this is the actual photo taken by the passenger in the third row seat right before impact, but there was no recording, so it was unknown if any of the passengers ever tried to warn the pilot. And that brings us to the pilots. First, let's talk about the Beaver. It's extremely unlikely he was ever going to see the Otter because he's got a passenger in the right seat and the structure of the aircraft would have blocked his view all the way until impact, so there was nothing he could really do to visually acquire the Otter. 
However, over in the Otter, you can see on this replay that both aircraft were converging at a relatively constant angle for about three minutes prior to the collision. And according to the FAA, the minimum time it takes for a pilot to detect another aircraft, judge a collision course, and then take evasive action is 12 and a half seconds. The only problem is that because of that constant converging angle, the Beaver would have produced very little or no apparent motion. And by the time that they're 80 seconds from impact, the Beaver would have been about the size of a thumbnail on the windscreen. And because the Beaver is at a lower altitude, his aircraft likely would have blended in with the background of the terrain behind him. And the NTSB came to the conclusion that starting about 11 seconds before the collision, the Beaver would have been behind the window post and not even visible until about a half second before the collision. And that explains why the pilot only recalled seeing a flash of red and white and then feeling the impact. Unfortunately, this was a terribly tragic event that resulted in six lives lost. And as a result of the accident, over a dozen Ketchikan commercial operators updated a letter of agreement to foster voluntary compliance with items designed to improve safety while flying in the area. The NTSB also made several recommendations that you can read more about in the report link in the video description below. And if you found this debrief to be helpful, be sure to check out another one on the channel and I'll see you next time.